Awesome. Hi, everyone. I am your host, Aaron Fine, and I am the social media marketing coordinator for MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I am joined today by the esteemed Dr. Herb Karpatkin, part of our ongoing interactive Q&A series titled Ask the Physical Therapist. He will be spending the next hour answering your questions about physical therapy and MS. Thank you, everyone, for your time, and we hope you enjoy this program. Now I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker, Dr. Herb Karpatkin is a highly experienced physical therapist specializing in MS. With over 40 years of experience, he holds a master's in physical therapy from Boston University and a doctorate in neurology from Rocky Mountain University of Health Professions. Certified in neurology and geriatric clinical by the American Physical Therapy Association, he's also a certified MS clinical specialist from the Consortium of Multiple Sclerosis Centers. Currently, <laughs> an associate professor at Hunter College. Dr. Karpatkin has delivered numerous presentations and published several articles on PT and MS. He's received awards like the 2015 APTA Award for Excellence in Neurolog Neurological Education and the 2019 NMSS Research Partners Award. His primary research focuses on improving mobility for individuals with MS. Dr. Karpatkin, we're so pleased to have you join us today, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to educate us all. Once I give everyone a little refresher as to how to submit your questions, I'll begin reading the questions to you, sir. So this is the Q&A portion. If you have a question or a comment, you can ask it using the Q&A button in the app, which will also allow you to send your question anonymously if you choose. You can also ask your question live by clicking the raise hand button or press star nine if you're using your phone. Once I call on you, you'll be able to unmute to ask your question. So let's get it underway. Dr. Karpatkin, thank you so much for joining us. And we will uh, check the uh, Q&A uh, portion of the Zoom app, as well as the uh, little, oh, here we go, of our webinar chat, and we'll get it going. So this first question is, what is the best drug for MS? Well, um, that's a great question, but I'm a physical therapist and not a neurologist. I can't prescribe medication. So that is a question you need to ask your neurologist. Uh, the reason that you need to ask is there are so many options for persons with MS regarding medication that you really need a specialist to match the medication to your MS. So there are literally dozens of medications for, uh, to deal with MS, um, to deal with the disease itself. There are several more that are to treat some of the symptoms like spasticity or fatigue. But again, uh, this is a question for a physician, not a physical therapist. So, sorry, Julie can't help. <laughs> it's totally, totally fine. Now, sir, while we wait for some questions, I was just curious, when it comes to physical therapy and MS, how do those two correlate? Well, I look at MS as a disease of movement. People don't go to uh, physicians complaining, well, gee, I feel really demyelinated today, or I feel you know, like my brain is inflamed. They're saying I have trouble walking or I have trouble balancing. And these are specifically the issues that physical therapists specialize in, not physicians, not nurses. These are PT issues. So if the MS is giving you trouble with walking, and it does for most people, over 90% of people with MS say that walking is one of their the most common issues they face, then you need to see a physical therapist because there's no profession which is better trained in helping people regain lost walking ability than physical therapy. So that's my short answer. It looks like we have a few questions here. We do. Elizabeth asks, how do I determine if bilateral posterior leg pain that occurs only in the morning upon awakening and in the evening more likely due to MS, spasms, or back words? Okay, that's a good question. I want to read it through again. How do I determine if bilateral posterior leg pain that occurs only in the morning upon awakening and the evening more likely due to MS spasms or back origins? That's a great question. Um, I would need to know more about you, but one thing uh, 
you may wish to consider is that some of the pain may not be due to MS. Um, it may be due to arthritis. I don't know how old you are, um, but it's a lot of people past the age of 40, 45, 50, MS or not, wake up with a lot of stiffness, particularly in their legs and low back. And that is very often due to arthritis. It loosens up over the course of the day. And then by evening, it gets, uh, by the evening, it improves, excuse me, it loosens up over the course of the day. And then by the evening, because of fatigue or overuse, the pain comes back. Um, if it's spasms, then there's medication that can treat it. Uh, and the spasms are in all probability due to the MS. Uh, if it's back pain, then the back, back pain uh, is separate from MS and you can get the back pain treated. It's an interesting question. I would love to have more time to examine you and figure out because it could be not just any one of those three, but more likely some combination of the three. Okay. Um, I see that uh, Elizabeth Rash also said, I'm on baclofen and Xanaflex. So obviously you have spasms. Um, uh, I'm wondering, do you take the baclofen and or Xanaflex right before you go to bed? Um, I find a lot of people who have pain at nighttime in the morning, uh, at the nighttime or in the morning, if they take their antispasticity medication right before they go to bed, they find out, they tell me that the pain is much less and they sleep much better. Something to consider. I see from Doris Stanley, what's my impression of the psionic neural sleeve? Um, I would have to say mixed. Um, I would say for some people, it's helped somewhat. Um, the problem with it is that although it does what it claims to do in that it selectively activates certain muscles that are weak, that usually is insufficient to create a big enough change to really impact walking. So there's one patient I've been working with on and off um, for a while, and I work with him and the rep from Psionic, uh, and who's been very good, and we keep trying to tweak it, the Psionic sleeve, to help my client the most. And we can, it helps somewhat, but it's not just the, there's so many problems in this gentleman's legs spasticity in some muscles, weakness in other muscles, loss of sensation somewhere else, fatigue. So the psionic helps a little bit. And it gives, given the cost, um, I'm a little bit leery of, of recommending it um, in a blanket way. It reminds me a lot of the, uh, of uh, blanking the, the name, the, uh, foot drop electrical stimulation, the bias. Um, it helps somewhat for the right people, but it's not a panacea. And I always get concerned that people are using the those devices um, when they're not really the best thing for them, but they're spending a lot of money. I see a question from someone named Anonymous Attendee. How are you? Attendee, it's good to see you again. Uh, does TENS help with muscle spasms? Um, not exactly. It can help with the discomfort of muscle spasms. Okay, Muscle spasms can be really uncomfortable, exquisitely painful sometimes, and it can help with that. It will not reduce the spasms. Okay, um, The only thing, in my opinion, which consistently reduces the muscle spasms that are a result of MS is medication such as baclofen and tizanidine. But the discomfort of muscle spasms can absolutely be improved with TENS. And it's something I've recommended and tried with many of my patients. 
Okay, Dr. Karpak, and we actually have a few questions coming in from Facebook. Let's go. Uh, all right, so uh, first one uh, asks us, Lin, Linjin asks, does sauna and, and or cold showers Sauna, absolutely not, never, no way, forget it, don't even think about it. It will absolutely make your symptoms worse. There is zero chance that it will help you. Um, the reason for this is that the symptoms of MS occur as a result of nervous system transmissions being sent through demyelinated nerves. The warmer your body gets, the more difficulty nerve transmission becomes through a demyelinated nerve. So it's literally making your MS worse. It's transient. It won't make it permanently worse. But there is zero benefit to it. And sometimes um, it can really take a day or two to recover from um, I, uh, was working with a gentleman fairly recently and his wife as a birthday present sent him to some men's wellness spa and he took a sauna and he said, well, it felt okay, but I just couldn't walk for the next day. Okay. On the other hand, a cold showers is something I recommend not just for, uh, people with MS, but for most people, there's a wealth of research coming out that shows that wealth, that cold showers or cold water immersion has many, uh, has many good properties. But speaking specifically about MS, I'll share some research with you um, where uh, we're in the midst of publishing a paper right now where we simply had persons with MS walk with a cold vest, a, a cooling vest, and they would walk for six minutes either with the vest or without the vest. And they walked much further when they were cooled. Similarly, we're looking at the effects of cooling on balance in persons with MS. And persons with uh, MS who were cooled did much better on balance testing. I'm also reminded of a patient I was seeing years ago. I was seeing him at his home. and. Sometimes I would get there and he would be so exhausted before I even got there, we couldn't get much work done. Work done. So I told him, before you come see me, take as cold a shower as you can. And the difference was dramatic. We could work hard, really hard for 45 minutes. So cold showers, big recommendation, hot saunas, the opposite. Great advice. That's really interesting. Um, we're going to keep this moving. April sure. from Facebook asks, what can I do to improve my movement when I have foot drop? Any specific movements or exercises? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and one of the most common ones that I get foot drop is, in my experience, over 40 years in the field, probably one of the most common issues that are imp impacting walking and balance in persons with MS. The first thing you need to do is stretch your calf muscles. Stretch, 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 stretch. Now, the question then becomes, what's enough stretching? And because a lot of people have told me, well, I stretch a lot, it doesn't seem to work. I then ask, well, what do you mean by a lot? I said, well, I stretch it for about 30 seconds every day. That is way too small a dosage. You have to start thinking of exercise like medication, where you need the right dosage of exercise to get the right impact of it. In the same way that the medications that you take for MS are clearly, are very specifically calibrated, so you get the right dosage, you have to think of exercise the same way. And the problem with most MS exercise exercise programs is that the dosage is too small. So um, doing foot drop exercises, particularly stretching the calf muscle you know, for several minutes a day 
is, is a good way to start. An even better way is to get some type of a resting splint, which stretches your calf for you and you wear it for a couple hours a day. So that is one of the first things I would recommend. The second is to try to strengthen the muscles in the front of your ankle, which pulls the front of the foot up, sort of the anti-foot drop position. And the best way to work on that is when you walk, try to really focus on landing on your heel. Really just try to purposefully take as many steps as you can landing on the heel of the tight foot. Next question, please. All right, we're back to the Q&A portion. Um, so we actually have a double prong question regarding psionic neuroses. One of them is, uh, Karen asks, uh, can you just explain the FES in psionic? Now, FES, I'm not sure, is an acronym or- is FES is an acronym for functional electric stimulation. Copy that. And it's called functional because it's used to provide a certain function, the activation of a certain muscle. So the way that psionic works is based on the position of your leg. Um, the psionic uh, sleeve will activate a certain muscle that's underneath the sleeve, causing the muscle to activate and therefore perform the movement that is that was being limited by the MS. Okay. So it uh, it basically uses electricity to turn on a muscle that MS has turned off. Okay. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, so we have an anonymous attendee who, this is, like I said, back to NeuroSleep. Uh, does the stimulation to help the muscles get stronger when walking with the sleep? Can you repeat that? Yes. So does the stimulation from the neuro, neuro sleeve help the muscles get stronger when walking with it? Uh, it kind of depends on what you mean by stronger. Mm -hmm. um, it will prevent it from getting weaker because it's being used a lot more. Okay, The muscle is being exercised. Whether there is a what is called a carryover effect, meaning that once you take the sleeve off, you know, say you use the sleeve for an hour a day for 50 days in a row, will that muscle be stronger afterwards than before? My experience is no. Um, it may be a little bit stronger because you're using the muscle more than before. But does the electricity lead to um, an increase in muscle growth and muscle strength such that it's used more so that you can use it better? That has not been my experience. Again, I'm not saying the device is worthless. Quite the opposite. I think it's helped many people, but I think it, it has a fairly narrow range of use. Fair enough. Um, Terry from Facebook asks, what are your thoughts on Pilates, Pilates, excuse me, Pilates as a form of PA? I assume PA you know, physical activity or something like that. Yeah, or maybe she meant PT. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's a bit of a general question, so let me try to answer this. For people with MS, Exercise is always better than not exercising. That is a given. So if you look at people doing Pilates, say you have two groups of people with MS, ident hypothetically identical. One group does Pilates for an hour a day, you know, for a couple of weeks, and one does absolutely nothing and sits on the couch and, you know, eats potato chips and drinks beer the group that does Pilates will do better. No question about it. Is there something magical about Pilates that helps MS? No. Pilates is a very specific type of exercise. I believe it was invented to help ballet dancers. 
um, strengthen their core muscles. And if the person with MS does have a specific core muscle issue, it could be helpful. But the thing about MS is there's no typical, there's no stereotypical type of person with MS. I've seen tens of thousands of persons with MS over my career, and each one's very different. Each one, the MS has affected in a very specific way. I have several patients who've done Pilates, and some have claimed it's really helped them, and some really can't say whether it has or not. They enjoy it. Um, one of the best things I can say about Pilates is that it, if it's the only thing that gets you to exercise, then it's the best thing. Um, but there's nothing for MS, there's nothing magical about it. And the reason for that is MS is just so incredibly variable. So I feel one of the things I like to say is that for every patient, every MS patient that I see, I feel like I have to invent a new physical therapy for them because each one has very specific needs. Uh, Maria asks, I've been able to continue working out 45 times per week. She's 53. Uh, trying to maintain my mobility and keep my strength. Which types of workouts should I prioritize? Um, the workouts that help you do the things that you want to do with your life. Um, uh, the current area of interest in MS exercise research is high intensity training. That seems to give you the most bang for the buck. And in my research and others research, it's had some pretty outstanding effects on gait and balance. So high intensity interval training is where instead of exercising slowly and continuously, you do a hard burst of exercise, something to really try and get your heart rate up, and then you stop and recover. And then you do it again. Work really hard, stop and recover. Work really hard, stop and recover. The reason why that can be very helpful for people with MS is because the most common symptom for people with MS is fatigue. And with the high intensity interval training, breaks are worked in. So we've been conducting a trial at Hunter College where I teach, um, where we're taking persons with MS and we're putting them in one of two different exercise groups. There's what's considered the standard exercise group where they walk for 20 minutes without a break at a comfortable pace, okay? And they do that two or three times a week for six weeks. In the other group, we have them walk for 20 minutes, but they do 30 seconds as fast as they can, and then one minute they take a break, and they do that for 20 minutes. In the group that does the high intensity work, meaning 30 seconds fast, one minute rest, they are improving in their gait and their balance and their leg strength and their leg flexibility much, much more. And we haven't had any ill effects. So I'm trying to get as many of my patients as possible to start trying programs like that. You don't have to go crazy, but instead of trying to go as long and as far as you can, do short, intense bouts of work and intersperse it with periods of rest. Two workouts are amazing. Uh, that's actually what I do um, as well. And uh, you get such a great workout in such a small period of time. So that's a great advice. Um, Christine from Facebook asked, my problem was finding a PT person that believed I had these symptoms. How can we stress what our symptoms are? That is, probably the most important question I get asked. Um, how do we find a PT who is familiar enough with MS so that they could be of some help to you? And as someone who's been in the field for 40 odd years, it's heartbreaking to me that when I come across a PT who does not know how to treat somebody with MS, because I know that it's taught in schools. 
and I know that there's courses you can take. So what I'm going to do right now is what I do on every single uh, talk I give, whether it's for the MSF or anyone else. If you reach out to me, I will find someone for you. Uh, my uh, G my email address, um, I think uh, you can, um, it's been posted in the past. It's H-E-R-B-K-A-R-P. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put it on the screen right now. And I invite you all to reach out to me um, and I can help you find, I have uh, people with, uh, I, have, I have a network of practitioners I'm aware of throughout the United States and I will help you find somebody. Don't you also but, have a location? You're right, it's it, just a second, but it's a big issue, you know, in the same way that for your MS, you know, you don't want to go to a a dentist. You don't want to go to, you know, a, a dermatologist. You want to go to a neurologist who is experienced with MS. It's the same thing with physical therapy. Okay. And I see someone says, what sort of activities might one incorporate when starting an HAIT exercise program? Um, it's going to depend on what your level is. Um, I try to get, if my patient is ambulatory in any way, even moderately, um, that's what I try to start with. So, you know, even if they're walking with a cane or a walker, I will say try to do 10 or 15 or 20 seconds or, or 20 feet as fast as you can. Okay? And if that just means slightly faster than usual, that's fine. But it's what the important thing is to get out of your comfort zone. Okay, walk so that it's a little bit, you know, uncomfortable for you. Push yourself to go harder than before, and then recover. If you can't walk, use a stationary bicycle. Okay, but something to go faster and harder than usual. I usually start people with walking, but if they can't walk, then either a stationary bike, a recumbent bike, a stepper works fine. What's more important is you do it hard, briefly hard, long recovery. Briefly hard, long recovery. Okay. Um, Vicky asks, I've had MS for 23 years and foot drop on my right side. My right foot is often purpley and slightly swelled. Is this Raynaud's or what can be done about it? Um, your right foot is purpley and sometimes it's probably not Raynaud's phenomenon, which is what I assume you're referring to. Um, Raynaud's has a very, very specific presentation and it's not the right foot. If you had Raynaud's, it would be your toes, not your foot. Um, but what you have is, is pretty, as I'm probably sure it's due to the MS and it's probably because of the foot drop you're not getting enough blood flow through your foot. So um, as I've said before, start stretching that foot, trying to get that, uh, that foot moving. Now, I was talking about psionic and bioness before, and I find, I didn't say this before, but I'll say it now, I find those devices are great for people who have that sort of swelling and discoloration of their foot because the electronic sti electric stimulation will make the muscles pump in the foot and get fluid draining out of the foot. So the purplish discoloration is more than likely due to lack of usage than the Raynaud's phenomenon, which is a separate phenomenon. Uh, next question is, what type of exercises do you recommend for secondary progressive MS? Same exercises I'd recommend for any other type of MS. Um, one of the more common questions I get, one of the most common questions I get is what sort of exercise should I do for MS? And that's an impossible question. The because no because I need to know about what kind of how the MS is affecting you. 
So it's worth thinking, you know, you don't have secondary progressive MS or primary progressive or relapsing remitting MS. You have your MS. You know, you, there's these, those secondary progressives or relapsing remittings, those are labels, but they're generalities. So what kind of exercise should you do? You should find the exercise that addresses the mobility issue that you're having the most. So if you're having trouble walking, you need to practice walking. If you're having trouble balancing, you need to practice balancing. If your arms are weak, you need to do arm strengthening. If your legs are tight, you need to stretch your legs. There's no perfect exercise for all people with MS. It's going to be highly individualized based on how the MS has personally affected you. Next question, what's your opinion on collagen? On collagen? Um, uh, I don't have one. Um, I haven't read anything that's led me to believe it's of any help for MS there. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of information out on the web uh, cl making claims that it will be helpful for MS. And I wish they all were true. I wish to God that all of these miracle cures actually worked. Um, I work with a lot of top MS doctors and researchers, and they wish the same thing. But the but these things that make claims that they will help um, without there being true scientific evidence behind it is, to me, similar to preying on the disabled. So will it help with something else? Maybe, I don't know, but I know there's no evidence that collagen is useful in MS. I wish that it was. So our next question, another anonymous question. Can you provide more information on the kind of splint you refer to help you stretch the calf? Sure. Um, it's, called a, it's called a night splint. Um, you can find it advertised as a plantar fasciitis splint. You basically put it on your foot. It holds your foot in a very gentle stretch. Okay. So... The best thing to do to stretch out your ankle is not stretch as hard as you can for 30 seconds, but stretch very gently for several hours. And that's what these braces will do. If you email me, I can, and I know my email's out there. If you email me, I will send you some examples of it, you know, that you can purchase on Amazon. Um, most of my patients have them. The, what most people find is, is that they put it on way too tight the first time, and it feels very comfortable for the first five minutes, and after 15 minutes, they're in agony because it's a slow but long stretch. So they have to put it on, and they wear it for 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes a night. Some, sometimes they'll sleep through the whole night with it. And uh, there's one wonderful woman I worked with for years who basic, who had to travel a lot. And she said she always brought it with her. And uh, she said she would never even think of sleeping without it because when she sleeps without it, she has trouble walking around the next morning. Okay. I have tightness in both hips. The spasticity in my legs will go away after a few minutes of walking, but the tightness in my hips remain. What exercises could help with this? Well, hard to say because your hips are made up of, uh, of multiple muscles, flexors, extensors, adductors, abductors, 
internal rotators, external rotators, elevators, depressors. So it depends which muscle is tight. Um, usually with people with MS, it's the hamstring muscles, which are the muscles in the back of the knee. They go from your buttock to behind the knee. And those tend to be very tight. So you should try stretching those out. But I don't know what's tight with you. I would recommend seeing a physical therapist who can examine you and figure out what muscles are tight. And those are the ones you need to stretch. Okay. Alex asks, how does one do high intensity training with a foot drop? Can you suggest some non-walking workouts? Absolutely. Um, most of the workouts in the literature are non-walking. They use a stationary bike or a recumbent bike. Uh, and the person gets on it and they do 30 seconds at a hard pace, a pace they would not be able to keep up for more than one or two minutes, but they just do it for 30 seconds. And then they do another minute and a half, really gentle. So 30 seconds of, of on the recumbent bike, you know, pretty hard, followed by a minute, really gentle. Okay, great. Uh, Doris, what's another difference between PT and personal training? Oh, one has a degree, the other one doesn't. One is licensed by the state of New York, and you have to go through an accredited three-year program after you finish college. So to get a degree in physical therapy, you have to have graduated, complete an undergraduate education, and then you have to apply to a doctoral program because you, you get a doctorate in physical therapy. To apply to the doctoral program, you have to have usually about 100, but sometimes more hours of previous experience as a volunteer working in a PT setting. Then you have to sub, uh, find a school to submit an application to. Um, you have to have done prerequisites in uh, biology, chemistry, physics, calculus, psychology, statistics. Um, I'm probably leaving a few out. Um, uh, and achieved a, a, a good score on those classes. Take the graduate record exam, apply to the program. The program is a three-year program of which about a half a year of it are different clinical rotations through different aspects of physical therapy, either orthopedics, neurology, uh, outpatient, and acute care. Um, and then you have to pass a state licensure exam. To be a personal trainer, uh, I may be wrong on this, but there's no state licensure for it. There are certain certificates you can get, but I think to be a personal trainer, I think the necessary prerequisite is to call yourself a personal trainer. This <laughs> is not to say that personal trainers cannot be helpful, quite the opposite. I refer to personal trainers all the time. I know several personal trainers who uh, who work with, specialize in working with people with MS, and I think they're amazing and they're fantastic. Uh, uh, but a physical therapist is a true doctoral degree, post-baccalaureate degree licensed by the state of New York. Personal trainers do not have any such degrees. Quite a difference. Uh, still helpful, but quite a difference. Uh, Christine from Facebook wants to know, I'm very active, but my right foot is freezing, and I do not have healing in my big toe. Is there a stretch to help me with this? Second part of the question. My feet can feel swollen, but don't look swollen after hit or running. Okay, that was more of a statement. But... Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, I've heard about that a lot. Um, the first thing to know is the freezing is not going to be helped by hot water or heating pads. It's more of a sensation thing. The best thing you can do is some kind of massage for your feet afterwards. Um, 
gentle massage, uh, particularly in your toes. Um, someone before asked about electrical stimulation um, for muscle spasms, that can also work. But I remember years ago, I worked with one very lovely woman and that was her biggest issue. Her feet were freezing. And, you know, she did well with her walking and well with her balance and everything, but her feet were just in agony. And what I would do at the beginning of every session uh, was to just massage her feet. And uh, it did, in addition to helping her, uh, you know, get better sensation in her feet, I think it also made her become addicted to my foot massages. But um, it did really make a difference. I ended up teaching her husband how to do the massages, which she was very grateful for as well. I don't know if he was. But um, you have to be aware that this it's not a temperature thing. It's a sensation thing. The nerves in your brain that control sensation in your foot are misfiring due to the MS. Yeah. Um, next question. What stretches do you recommend for the calf? For the what? For the calf. Well, I'm a, um, so some, anything that lengthens the calf muscle, probably the easiest one is called the runner's stretch. Most of you know it. You put both hands on a wall. Say you want to stretch your right calf. You put your right foot uh, about 12 to 18 inches behind your left, okay? keeping the right knee straight. You put your left foot in front and you bend the left knee. You keep the right heel on the floor and slowly you're going to feel a pulling sensation in the calf. And you just hold that, usually for a good long time, a minimum of 30 seconds, but I usually recommend much, much more than that. An alternative to that, which a lot of my patients like, is getting something called an incline board. And it's, again, it's something you can get on Amazon, and it's basically a board that holds you at an incline. It could be either 15 or 20 or 25 disease, degrees. So it's basically you're standing with your feet stretched out. Your toes are higher than your heels, and people just get on it and hang out there. And... Uh, it's usually pretty comfortable. And I know some of uh, my patients will have them in their office and they'll just stand on them while they're working or while they're watching TV or something. Awesome, that's great advice. Um, next question comes from an individual who's 73 and relegated to bed exercises. How to hit? So I guess how to do hit exercises. Uh, can you reread the question, please? Sure. As it's stated, I'm 73, relegated to bed exercise, how to hit. How, so how do you do high intensity training in bed? Yes. Um, so I'm assuming that means you can't get out of bed. Um, it's hard to say without knowing uh, what you are capable of. The first thing that I would consider um, is if you're not well enough to get out of bed, the first thing I would consider is doing breathing exercises. Um, and you could certainly do high intensity breathing exercises. Uh, uh, there are devices, there's one device called a P-Flex, which is a respiratory muscle trainer. It's a similar device called the, uh, called the breather. And it just increases the work of breathing. It makes your respiratory muscles work harder. And what can be done, what's normally done with them is you breathe through it fairly comfortably for 15, 10 or 15 minutes at a time. What some of my patients have recommended and have told me they've tried is they'll put it at a much harder level and they'll do it for like one minute and then recover one minute and then recover. So they're doing high intensity respiratory muscle training. Okay. But the basis of respiratory muscle, of high intensity training is to work at a harder rate than you could for 
three or four or five minutes, but just do it for 30 seconds. So it doesn't much matter what you do. What matters is the intensity of what you do. And the intensity has to be hard enough that you need to recover. But the, the key thing is act, actually the recovery. The more you recover, the more work you can do. And it's a really common problem I see in MS in that patients will work for as long as they can and then they'll get fatigued and then they'll stop. And that keeps them from exercising at a high enough dosage or volume to get the best benefit of the exercise. So I urge people with MS to exercise and then take a break and then exercise some more and take a break, exercise some more. That way you'll get a higher dosage of exercise. Okay, Marcel wants to know, do you advise exercises on steppers to improve balance? Um, do I advise them? I advise balance training if your balance is impaired. Um, and steppers are good because they're more stable than uh, than uh, walking on a treadmill or walking over ground because your feet don't leave the ground. The problem with steppers is it is, to my mind, a bit of an unnatural movement. You will improve your balance by working on a stepper, but you will improve your ability to balance on a stepper. So if you balance is very specific, um, if your balance is poor on a stepper and you practice balance on a stepper, your balance on the stepper will get better but it may not improve for other tasks. So if your balance is poor, the first thing I want to find out is in what task is your balance poor? Is it poor while standing, while walking, while turning your head, while bending over, while looking up, while walking inside, outside, while walking uphill or downhill, walking on uneven terrain, walking at nighttime or daytime eat i would when i examine a patient i examine their balance under all those conditions and that gives me an idea of what type of exercise balance exercise they should do so steppers are good um, they get your heart rate up they certainly exercise your legs will it improve your balance it will it'll improve your balance on the stepper i'm if you need to improve your balance for other activities, I would suggest practicing balance in those activities. Okay. Um, next question. I have MS with symptoms in my mobility, but was told recently that my pain and walking difficulty is from spinal stenosis in my lower back. What exercises would you recommend for spinal stenosis in the lower back? Oof. Um. So let me make sure I understand the question. So you have MS, but you also have spinal stenosis? Yes, that's okay. what it's like. And so you have this uh, this double whammy here of walking difficulty due to MS mm -hmm. plus walking difficulty due to spinal stenosis. Yes. Um, in my experience, that's a great question because one of the things I've noticed over the years is that people with MS are living longer and longer and longer. And so I'm seeing more and more people in their 70s and 80s with MS. 30 years ago, I would almost never see that. So spinal stenosis um, means a narrowing of the spinal canal, the canal through which your spinal cord and nerves exits through. So to treat spinal stenosis, you have to increase the space inside that canal. And one of the ways to do that is by flexing your spine, by instead of uh, trying to extend your spine and get up straight, try to bend over as much as possible. 
and hold that stretch for a while. Okay. And again, that's something a physical therapist can help you. It's very individualized um, how people present with spinal stenosis. So I would recommend finding a PT who specializes in that, which is actually quite a bit easier than finding a PT who specializes in multiple sclerosis. Okay, Dr. Karpakin, um, someone wants to know, is there an exercise slash stretch to help the neck nerve, the, the way they phrase it is the neck nerve to hand to relieving burning pain in middle fingers? Uh, um, yes, um, that is probably not the MS. That sounds like something called a radiculopathy, okay? And it's not due to the MS. Um, again, without seeing you, it's hard to say, but I'm going to take a few guesses. Um, it because it's a really, really common condition. Uh, if you sit too much looking over a computer or a cell phone or something with your head down and your chin on your chest, that is compressing the nerve. So one of the first things I have people do is try to have them do the opposite. Instead of looking down at the floor, look up at the ceiling. So you're mm -hmm. stretching out the front muscles of your neck and you hold that stretch for a while. If you spend a lot of time looking at a computer, make sure the screen is at your eye level, not at low level, so you're looking down on it. But it's almost certainly the pain you're experiencing is postural. So you have to fix your posture, and that usually means trying to get your chin off your chest. Okay? Um, another thing you can do, a great exercise for this, uh, which has a similar effect, is to pinch your shoulder blades together and hold that for five or 10 seconds and then relax, okay? Fixing the posture is going to really improve the space that the nerve has and the, the tingling and burning in your fingers is from that nerve being pinched. If you reverse the curve in your neck and stretch out your shoulder blades, you're going to give that nerve more room and you're going to have a decrease in those symptoms. Uh, this is another finger question. Would a brace or splint help finger pain at night from sleeping? It depends on what the finger pain is from. Mm -hmm. um, okay. If the if uh, your wrist is getting stiff, if your fingers are getting stiffer and stiffer, if you wake up with a bald fist, um, then it's definitely a good idea to wear a splint. Um, but it's going to depend on what's causing the stiffness and pain in the first place. I imagine if it's due to MS, it's due to spasticity in the hand. And uh, you need medication for that. But to keep the hand from getting stiffer and stiffer, yeah, using some type of a brace to hold your hand open is probably a good idea. Okay. Um, Alex would like to know, how often each day should you stretch? How often each day? Well, uh, I, I like the part that you said each day because that's the first part of my answer. Every day. Think about stretching like brushing your teeth. You brush your teeth every day. You bathe every day. You go to the bathroom every day. You take your medicine every day. So you should think about stretching the same day way. How often? Um, I would much rather err on the side of doing long stretches gently than short stretches uh, intensively. And I can't give you an exact number. My guess, is, I, but I can will say that I have never, ever in all my years encountered a patient who stretched too much. Oh. So, um, so someone would like to know, uh, basically, what can help with coordination and someone's equilibrium? Coordination, great question. Coordination and equilibrium are two different things. Okay. Um, the equilibrium, I'm assuming you mean balance. Mm -hmm. And the if you have problems with balance, you got to do balance exercises. 
Uh, and that is something a good PT can help you with. It's relatively straightforward. You got to practice them every day, just like the previous questioner pointed out. Um, equilibrium can also refer to something vestibular. Um, if you're referring to equilibrium as a sense of dizziness or vertigo, that is also really common in MS. And that is another thing that could be treated by PT. For coordination, that's a much more interesting problem. It is the, by coordination, I'm assuming you're referring to the ability of the muscles to perform the tasks that you want them to perform with the right timing and the right strength mm -hmm. and, you know, um, contracting at the right time and relaxing on the right time. Problems with coordination are what I prefer to call motor control, but I think they mean fundamentally the same thing. Uh, often is a result partially of the MS, but partially due to lack of work, lack of practice. Okay, So let me give you an example. I had a patient once who was a really skillful piano player, probably could have been a professional. Um, and she loved playing piano. And with the MS, the piano playing became harder and harder for me. And she said at one point, this is too depressing, I'm going to stop. About three or four weeks later, she said, I think my MS is, I'm, I'm experiencing a bad MS exacerbation because I'm having trouble holding a pen and I'm having trouble uh, buttoning my clothes, and I'm having trouble, you know, using silverware. I'm having trouble opening a jar. And so I looked at what the change was, and the difference was is she'd stopped her piano playing. She stopped using her hands for those 30 to 60 minutes a day. So I said, rather than assume your MS is getting worse, let's try going back to your piano playing for you know, half an hour a day and see if that helps. And not surprisingly, it did help. So one of the big issues with loss of motor coordination or motor control is lack of use. A, a, a skill in MS gets harder, so you do it less, which makes it harder. So you do it less, which makes it harder. So you do it less. It's this vicious circle. And this is probably one of the most common scenarios I see in persons with MS, this sort of vicious circle of something gets harder, so you do it less, which makes it harder, do it less, et cetera, et cetera. And I think a great deal of the disability that I see in MS is actually due to that. I call it secondary weakness, meaning that it's not due to the MS, it's due to the fact that because of the MS, you've stopped using that body part or performing that skill. And that means that a lot of the weakness, a lot of the motor control deficits that I see in MS can be improved quite a bit, but you have to do the exercise. Hmm. So we have just a couple minutes left. So I just wanna close with one final thought here. I want to tell everybody out there that with MS, that there is something out there for you that will absolutely improve your MS symptoms. Zero question about it. And it's called exercise. And it is some, it is very dose dependent. There is a right dose of exercise and most people are underdosing themselves. It is also very specific to the type of MS that you have. So you need to find an MS specialist who will do an evaluation and will treat your specific MS. But persons with MS, you know, I've been working with MS for 35, 40 years, and persons with MS are, in my opinion, some of the hungriest patients I've ever seen, meaning they are so hungry to look for things and try things to get them better. And it's one of the reasons I love working with people with MS, 
because they will, whatever's out there, I'm going to go for it. So I'm telling you, I'm begging you, go for exercise. Find a program that works for you, and it, which means your program, and do it, and do it hard, and do it every day. And I promise you, you'll have a good outcome as a result of that. It has never, ever been my experience that somebody did not improve with exercise. Okay. So I wanted to make sure I got that in before five o'clock. So fantastic. Do we have time? We have time for one more question. Sure. Okay? Go ahead. Uh, someone would like to know any good exercises for knee osteoarthritis? Um, yes. Uh, the most important thing for knee osteoarthritis is to keep your knee moving. Okay. The more immobile your knee is, the worse the worse your arthritis will get. So you need to do something, ride a bike, go for a walk, you know, uh, pool exercises, but you need to keep that knee moving. The type of exercise is not nearly as important as the fact that you do exercises. Okay? The more immobile you are, the worse the arthritis will get. Okay, well said, sir. Um, I think that will uh, complete things for this session of Ask the PT. Um, before uh, I get into uh, our final remarks, I'd like to let everyone know that uh, if you check the chat, you will have uh, Dr. Karpakin's uh, Gmail address if you wanted to ask him any specific questions. Uh, also, sir, is there the clinician locator map? Is that still something that is, um, you know, it should be, open it should be right on. It should be on the MSF website. Yeah. Um, and we're updating it, you know, pro probably every day. Um, but if you can't find somebody on the clinician locator map, um, get in touch with me because I can find people who are not on the clinician locator map who I've. I've begged them to get on the map, but they haven't done it yet. So I'll just, you know, have you call them directly. Fantastic. And, you know, it's exactly how it sounds for those um, who are hearing this for the first time. It's literally a way for you to connect with um, professionals in your in your area that can help with uh, your MS. Um, so with that being said, uh, this brings us to the end of this event. If you missed any part, it has been recorded and will be available through the MS Focus Facebook and YouTube channels. Please reply to your registration email for more info by participating in a short survey sent to you after the webinar. You'd help us learn this type of info more meaningful and helpful to you as the attendees of these conferences. If you'd like to support programs like these, consider donating at msfocus.org slash donate. Be sure to check out our supporter savings program where you can save more than you give as well. Uh, join us next time on Tuesday, May 14th at 4.30 p.m. Eastern with Dr. Ben Thrower for another installment of our Ask the MS Expert series. Our sincere thanks to all of our attendees for your participation and especially Dr. Karpakin, who continually takes time out of his busy schedule to help us educate us all. Goodbye everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. so much. Good luck.